that the Son of Man would be given up to the elders and killed, and on the third day rise again. The time ensuing was the Gospel of yesterday, Saturday, the word of the second prediction, saying the very same thing to the apostles. We're going to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be given up to the elders, he'll be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Today we hear the same thing, the third prediction. The Lord is again telling his apostles to prepare them for what's going to take place. The apostles didn't want to go to Jerusalem. There were many attempts on the life of Jesus already in Jerusalem. They didn't want to go there. Uh, the gospel records attempts where they tried to assassinate our Lord. They were safe in Galilee, but our Lord was in a hurry, it says in the gospels, to go to Jerusalem. And he was setting the pace of the apostles were following him. They were ready to keep it up with them. The Lord was anxious to get to Jerusalem. In the third prediction, he says the same thing. That the chief priests and the elders, that they'll give him up to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles, that they'll mock him, spit upon him, scourge him, and kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. And so three times our Lord was saying to the apostles, he's been with them three years already. He's been preparing for this entrance into Jerusalem, which we call Palm Sunday, for the church of place called the entrance of our Lord into Jerusalem, which we celebrate next Sunday. For three years, our Lord has been preparing his apostles for this event, this great entrance into Jerusalem, to endure his saving passion, death, resurrection, and ascension. And so it says the apostles, at first, it says they did not understand and they were afraid. Today's gospel just says they were astonished. They were astonished and they were afraid. They didn't want to go there. Jesus, how about if he steals? What about this kingdom he talks about? <clears throat> and what would happen to them? And so they have trepidation. They're not very happy people. And then, two brothers, John and James, they come up to our door. The others are traveling behind them. And they said, well, you do us a favor. Jesus says, what? He says, when you get into the kingdom, let my brother and I let us be on the left and the right of the kingdom. The other ten are a little behind. They don't know what the, the Lord is talking to uh, James and John about. But they're leaving Peter out, the chief of the apostles. They're cutting a deal with the Lord, making a kind of ploy, as it were, that they would be the ones sitting in glory at the left and the right of the kingdom. Because after three years, they still didn't understand what the kingdom was about. They didn't understand that the kingdom wasn't here. It was the kingdom of heaven that our Lord was talking about. That all his miracles confirmed. After three years, in the final weeks before our Lord is entering to Jerusalem, three years of public ministry, of miracles, of teachings, even the twelve did not rightly understand. They were thinking that the Romans would be overthrown, that Jesus would be anointed king, and that they would be those sharing the glory of the Lord. And so we could imagine what was in the mind and the heart of our Lord. We wonder if anyone could convince and teach and try to change their ways and their minds and their thinking, it would have been the Lord. But humans are humans. And even John, the most beloved apostle, was in this ploy with his brother James that they would get the sh chief places in the kingdom. The Lord says, you don't know what you're asking about. He said, what we do it. So it's going to drink of the cup I'm about to drink and be baptized for the baptism I'm about to receive. They didn't even understand that. They said yes. Well, the cup was the cup of suffering. The baptism was the baptism of witnessing and martyria for the faith. But yes, they would endure that. Now Lord says, yes, you will drink of the cup and you will have that baptism that I'm baptized to be baptized in. But for sitting in the kingdom, that's not my business. That's the business of my father. And so it says the other ten that they're indignant. They're upset. They're not upset that Peter, that James and, and John, that they wanted the glory of the kingdom. That wasn't their problem. They wanted the same glory. They were upset that James and John didn't advocate for all of them. Why are you being so selfish? You, James, and John. Even Peter, your best buddy, you're leaving out. And what about the rest of us? What's the matter with you people? And then our Lord says to the twelve, 
He says, it's the Gentiles that have ordered over others with authority. But not so you. This isn't the way I taught you. That whoever wants to be first among you, he will be the servant. And the one that wants to serve, he will be the slave. Our Lord has identified himself as servant, deacon, diaconist. He's saying that he himself, Christ, that he's a servant. Not only does he say he's a servant, but he says he's a lulus. He's a slave. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He says, if you want this kingdom of glory, that this kingdom of glory is for the Father to give, but the way into that kingdom, the entrance into that kingdom is a way of lowliness. It's a way of servitude. It's a way of being humble for the other. He says, this is what should characterize you as my apostles. And so we see that our Lord here, when he entered Jerusalem next week, we see that even his glorification, as it were, his exaltation, that even then the Lord arranges all this and tells the apostles, go get the, the, uh, the asset and the folk and put the guard. When he arranges all his entrance to Jerusalem, what kind of entrance is that? What king comes on a donkey? What king comes not with emblems of victory and surrounded by soldiers? Here you have children with palms in their hands shouting Hosanna. You have a crowd of people and they welcome him because they thought the same thing the apostles were thinking. That this man, Jesus, the Messiah, the promised one, that he will come. Hosanna the highest blessed he who comes in the name of David, the king of Israel. He will restore us. He will overthrow the Romans. He will again create the kingship in Jerusalem. Our Lord, he was not understood. He was understood not only by the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the chief priests, and the elders. He wasn't understood by Pontius Pilate. And he even wasn't understood by his apostles. Many of the apostles would understand, yes. But at this stage, they were people of fear, of anxiety, of seeking apart for themselves, of glory. And the Lord is saying, the kingdom of God, it's not that glory. The glory of the kingdom of God is doing the will of the Father. And that Jesus, he allows himself not to be executed. It's not a martyrdom that Jesus receives. His life isn't taken from him on the cross. He gives up his life. It's a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice of ransom, as Jesus says, a ransom for many, to save them from their sins, to give them the impossibility of having an eternal life. So Jesus Christ becomes the high priest. He becomes the sacrifice itself. He offers himself in lowliness for all mankind to take away our sins. And so the apostles, gradually they were learning and when the Holy Spirit came on Pentecost, <clears throat> and after the 40 days of our teaching in Jerusalem, appearing to them in Jerusalem after he risen from the dead, he talked to them about the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, so they would better understand what this kingdom was all about. And the Holy Spirit would inspire them. And they would have a sense then of what our Lord was teaching and doing. That the service of the Lord was one of servanthood. That he came not to master, the apostles they called him master, teacher. Not because the teacher was a master, but he never said himself that he was the master. That he says he is the servant, he is the slave, that he is the lowly one who comes to do for the human race the only thing that God himself could do. And so as our Lord goes to Jerusalem again, and <clears throat> mystically, we remember these things. That we're called to remember this service of our Lord. Humble service. Not giving himself over to glorification. The glory of Christ was to glorify the Father. He took nothing for himself. Nothing for himself. But the glorification, the sacrifice of our Lord was for the glory of God the Father. And we have to remember that. We're called in this gospel today to remember
remember the humble service of our Lord is servant to and that that's what his followers are called to remember. And that's what we, his disciples and followers, are called to remember. That's why we wear that cross on the right of neck. But it's a symbol, it's a sign. It reminds us of what? That we were ransomed. We're ransomed people. We were bought from death, from sin, by the blood of Christ on the cross. That Christ gave himself as a sacrifice, the humble one. He allowed himself to be humiliated. And he humbled himself, taking up the cross and being crucified on the cross and dying in ignominious death on the cross. And we're called to remember it. That's what Holy Week will be all about, remembering these authentic things. But not only remembering, but imitating Jesus Christ himself in his humility. All authority of the Christian faith is an authority of service, of humble service, of love, of doing everything to the glory of God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's no power structure in the church. Well, there is sometimes, unfortunately, but it shouldn't be there. But the real power, the real authority of the church, of Christians, of each one of us, is an authority of servitude and love for the other. Let us imitate our Lord Jesus Christ. How wonderful it is. He doesn't rebuke John and James, you notice in the Gospel. He doesn't say those things that after three years you really don't get the picture yet. He doesn't do that. He knows their weakness. He knows what's in their hearts and in their will. But they still weren't completely baked over as Christians yet. It's the same thing with us. We're not fully baked Christians yet. Hopefully we're in the process of being baked, of becoming more Christ-like, more Christ-bearers. But we can only do it when we're in full alignment with our Lord and 